you. Uh, welcome all. Welcome all. My name is Adil Najm. I am a member of the board of the Center for Study of Asia and the director of the Frederick S. Pardee Center for the Study of the Longer Range Future here at Boston University. It's a great pleasure to, to, to welcome all of you and to welcome our guest uh, to Boston University. It's wonderful to see a, a, a full and brimming and enthusiastic room, and I can promise you you're going to get some really enthusiastic and interesting uh, uh, performance as well as discussion today. So, so welcome all. Uh, it, is, it is, as I said, a great pleasure to, to, to be here for all sorts of reasons, most importantly because of our guest, uh, but also because uh, one of the key uh, purposes of the center, and I speak for the director, Joe Few Smith, who's, who's here, uh, the Center for the Study of Asia, but also of the Party Center, is to, is to bring together the various uh, departments, the various schools, the various activities that happen around uh, Boston University, in the one case around the issues uh, related to Asia, in the other case around issues related to development. So it's always good to get out of your home turf, uh, to cross that bridge, uh, literal and metaphorical. And, 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 and come and speak and be with colleagues. So, so that's, that's a great pleasure in both, both those capacities. Uh, we have a, a rich and full afternoon planned here for you. Uh, I'm not going to take uh, too much time uh, on the introduction beyond saying uh, that um, for us at the Party Center, this is kind of culture fest. Uh, we are slightly more techy than, than people are here, uh, but this week has been our culture fest. On Friday, we did a major seminar on energy, culture, and society, thinking about all sorts of issues ranging from you know how our food is determined by the type of energy we use, uh, how our buildings, how our clothes, and how society and politics is, is, is related to that. Uh, this afternoon, we have this wonderful event, uh, and this evening, we will start just by way of publicity, if I might, uh, we will have a two-day international conference that starts tonight on climate change, arts, and the media. Uh, and this starts today uh, at 6 at the trustees' ballroom. Amongst the speakers is, uh, is Andy Refkin of the New York Times, Beth Daly of the Boston Globe. We have a bunch of excellent um, leading journalists from Germany, a bunch of movie makers, including the Yes Men. I don't know how many people know about them and their movies, but, 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 but quite, quite a gig that they have there. So just by way of saying that we, we are continuing on this path and we hope that you will uh, be with us on that. Uh, there's also a sign up sheet up there for the party center and I, I hope also for the Center for Study of Asia. Both of them have lots and lots of uh, events that keep going on and I would urge you uh, to please check out the websites of both places and to sign up uh, for those events. Those are very, very rich calendars and I hope uh, that you will you will look into that. My gratitude to, to Andre for, for, for conceiving of this, for this, to the Center for Study of Asia uh, for supporting this and for all the other supporters uh, and sponsors of this program who have made this, this possible. Uh, without much further, let me ask uh, our, 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 our uh, host and friend Andre de Quadros to please come and introduce our guest and get us going with the program. Andre. The, the mic, the mic is obviously for recording, isn't it? Right. I was wondering why, why you were holding the mic. Give somebody to hold. <laughs> um, so I, I just want to make uh, make uh, sure that you know who's sponsoring this because it's a wonderful thing to have so many organisations at the university sponsoring um, Dr. Sarabai's visit and. Uh, the Center for the Study of Asia, of which its director Joe Fusmith is here, and, and I want to take the opportunity to thank Mike Carroll, without whom this really would not have happened. Um, the CAS core curriculum, thank you very much, Dr. David Eckel, uh, from CAS, College of Arts and Sciences, uh, the School of Theater and the School of Music, uh, both here and, and, uh, and their hosts, Stephen Cornelius and Brita Heimark. Um, and of course the party center and it, I think it's a wonderful uh, opportunity for us to have our very first collaboration um, you're pointing um, and and our colleagues do uh, our first collaboration with the party center on this soil I think that's a, a very important uh, moment for us because the party center does bring together the the university and its many elements together so um, now it is a great pleasure that I introduce Dr. Malika Sarabai to you and, and, her, and her two um, partners, uh, Jayan and Papan. 
um, they will present together. And uh, I got to know uh, Dr. Uh, Sarabhai when she came for um, a visit a couple of years ago, and uh, she made a profound impression on us in the way that she connects the arts and social context, and, and her passion for, for changing not just India, but changing the world um, through taking on the difficult issues of our times, whether it be the environment, whether it be women's health, whether it be, whether it be women's rights, uh, and all through an artistic uh, experience and through community mobilization. She comes from a long uh, uh, history of, uh, of involvement in the arts, predominantly through her, her mother, uh, who founded the Darpana Academy in Ahmedabad, which is the city of Mahatma Gandhi's birth and the place where he launched the, in the independence movement in India. And Malika has become uh, famous not only uh, in India, everybody knows her work there, but all over the world. And not only as, a, as an artist for so social context, but also as a performing artist in all kinds of different ways. Uh, she, for example, was, was a key um, dancer and actress in the Peter Brooks Mahabharat, which toured the world for two years. And so uh, you can read all about her on, on her website. And I'm not going to take up the time uh, with trying to summarize what is an extraordinary life, but except now to ask you to join all of us in welcoming Malika. I don't have to that. <laughs> when my mother decided to start dancing, the British had banned classical dancing in India for 200 years and had reduced it to being prostitution and had reduced all practitioners of the dance to be prostitutes. So as a three-year-old, uh, in a highly educated uh, half Tamil, half Malayali family, uh, to suddenly say, I am a dancer, her father, who was a, a Supreme Court lawyer, and her mother, who was one of India's first women elected politicians, had no idea what this child was talking about. But so she became, in the late 30s, early 40s, uh, one of the first educated, British educated, um, articulate women to bring the dancing, the classical dancing, outside of the temples and all the negativity that surrounded it, uh, and founded this institution in Ahmedabad where she married. Uh, called Darpana, and I think the word Darpana, which means mirror, in many ways signifies all the work that we do. Because she called it Darpana because she felt that arts was the only language that could mirror life back to people. And whether it was a convex mirror or a concave mirror or a realistic mirror, the arts had to show what people didn't want to see or found uncomfortable to see. And it was very early on that she took this language which spoke of beauty, which spoke of the spiritual, which spoke of the search for the inner self, whether we call it God or nirvana or truth or science or whatever. And she started talking about something that bothered her in the land in which she had married. And that was the daily news of young brides killing themselves. Uh, she read of young women two months into their marriages, six months into their marriages, jumping into wells, and she couldn't figure out what was the torment that drove them to this self-annihilation. And she started researching it and found that it was the pressure brought by the husband's family to bring in more money from the parental house in a continuation of the dowry payment, and that this pressure used to make the girls feel so terrible because already they knew that their parents had probably gone into debt to buy them the gold jewelry that the husband's family demanded and so on. And they didn't want to be pawns in this trade of greed that they killed themselves. So she created a performance using the purest classical language, hitherto only talking of love, to talk about violence and suicides. And she took this to Delhi uh, and Prime Minister Nehru happened to be in the audience and happened to know the family very well. So she, he came backstage and said to her, Mrinal, what was that about? And she described what had happened. And that is how the first ever inquiry commission into dowry debts was brought about. So imagine this innocent dance piece 
leading to uncovering what we now think has killed 30 million Indian women in the last 20 years. And these are United Nations figures. Uh, dowry deaths are alive and flourishing even more in this time of globalization and greed. So the issue continues. But think of me as a young child uh, seeing this happening. So when I grew up, I didn't even think that other people thought of art as entertainment. I just assumed that the arts were to talk about things that mattered to you, the things that needed to break through walls and get to people. Uh, I went through a circuitous route of thinking that the only thing I don't want to do is a professional artist because it's too much work. Went and did a PhD in management and one in psychology and went all over the place. And finally, one morning decided, you know, what am I doing? I want to use the arts to talk about what I want to talk about. Uh, so here I was, and as uh, Andre just mentioned, um, as, a, as, a, as a dancer who was really becoming very well known, I was plucked by Peter Brook to perform in this huge five-year project called the Mahabharata. I was the only Indian in an Indian epic, and I was chosen to play the woman I have always hero worshipped. It's a woman called Draupadi, and to me is the only woman that paternal historic writing or patriarchal mythology has not reduced into a black and white tin image. And as I played her across all sorts of audiences in 22 countries in the world, people would come up to me, women would come up to me and say, you know, how come we only hear about bashed up women in India? Why don't we hear about characters like this? That I relate to. And I suddenly thought, if just my playing one strong, feisty 21st century woman who happened to live 3,000 years ago can have this effect on women, then, you know, why am I bothering being an activist separately? This is obviously where my activism has to lie. Which is how, when I finished with the play in 1990, I started creating my own work, because I couldn't find anybody to write what was in my head. So I was forced into writing. And it's been an amazing journey. Because it started off as a very personal journey to talk about things I wanted to through performance. And it has filtered into our institution working with um, <laughs> women birth givers in villages, uh, teaching them songs about safe delivery so that they sing the songs and they know that they need, to, uh, they need to sterilize the blade with which they cut the umbilical cord. It means uh, working with mothers and families in rituals of birth that used to talk of innocuous things, but now giving them songs in the same in the, in the same way, but changing the lyrics to tell them what they should eat before the pregnancy and after, how they should breastfeed, or how they should look after the baby. And it has also meant working with government agencies to try and create performances to sensitize Supreme Court judges of all the SARC countries so that they deal with women's issues better. So before I even talk further, I would just like to, can we have the lights off? I would just like to show you some of the work that I can't show you but will be able to. It's the mainstream performances. This is just a series, a, a little glimpse of some of the kind of work we do to try and share with you that for me, however important the message is, it still needs to be entertaining enough to keep my audience in their seats whether they agree with me or not. At the end of the show, they can say that's nonsense and leave. But it's still, it can't be agitprop. And I think. If there is a uniqueness in our work, it is that we are primarily an arts and television agency that is totally committed to social work. So we go from the point of view of looking at audiences across the world and then bring in what we think matters. Jen. Mrs. Patel. I'm, I'm really sorry. The fetus is very abnormal. You must have an abortion. Ha, doctor, lekin ladka hai ya ladki? Mrs. Patel, it is a boy, but you must have an abortion. Are Bhagwan ne meri sun li? Mrs. Patel did not have an abortion. A son was born. Sweets were distributed in the entire neighborhood. A child who will never talk. Never walk, never dance, never sing. A son who is alive but will never live. 
I started hearing that other doctors were doing the test. Some were doing it at a cut rate. Others were doing only the sex determination test. And I phoned them and I said, why are you doing this? They said, doctor, there's a lot of money to be made in this. If you don't do it, somebody else will. You might as well make money. Isn't this what drug pushers say? Isn't this what arms manufacturers say? Look at you. Look at you. You are peaceful people. Your parents were peaceful people. Your grandparents were peaceful people. So much peace in one place. How could it be otherwise? But what if... Yes. What if one little gene in you has been trying to get through from your beginnings in Africa to each generation? They've been passed on to you in your creation. It's a secret urge hiding deep in you. And if it's in you, it's in me too. Oh, yeah. It's what made you sack your baby brother. Sack on a cockroach. Something we did because suicide rates were going up very dramatically in India. And there was this big issue about families' terrible guilt about somebody committing suicide. So this was based on case studies of suicide or tried suicide. My life. But what exactly would you do with it? Advice is not much better. Be yourself, I could say, but who are you? Residue. A word inside their mouths. You struggle to speak. Slave to your need to talk. Your eyes are misbehaving again. Teach them not to stray. My world is not a museum piece. It is fortunately too common for that. My angers, my desires, they're all petty. All very casual and complete.
whisper of the dreams, it's the roar of the race. It's not the color of her heart, it's the color of her face. It's not the whisper of the dreams, it's the roar of the race. That last piece was created really out of the commonality of issues of violence against women across the world. And that particular sequence is uh, a sequence that talks of the silence that women have when they see another woman suffering. Uh, because it's a silence that has been imposed by societies. And we think that very often that if we get involved, we'll get so pulled in that we won't be able to come out of it. The singer is a Pakistani British singer called Samia Malik. And there was an Italian actress dancer. There was an Afro-American uh, uh, dancer from, uh, from Philadelphia. And there were three of us. And funnily enough, uh, it toured India. And it was the first piece since, since India's independence that as an Indo-Pakistani piece went to Kashmir. And uh, we performed it in Srinagar and in Jammu. And it was amazing to see, see the reaction of a Pakistani Muslim and an Indian Hindu. And this group, which touched, uh, the, the, we, we, which talked to all the women uh, in the audience, and probably all the men also who beat up their wives. But uh, it was an interesting journey. This is on one level of our work. This is the level where we go and perform. But our work goes all the way down. Uh, there is a lot of work that we do where we train grassroots people. For instance, we'll pick young people from villages, ask them if they want to do something on the issue of health or on the issue of whether they're interested in trying to improve the lives of people around them. And then we bring them in. We train them to be actor activists. We train them to learn how to develop scripts, how to write songs, how to develop comic books to help about health issues, to develop board games. I was talking earlier in the School of Public Health, and I was saying how we've developed Ludo and snakes and ladders and so on to talk about things like the need for breastfeeding or the need to have regular medical checkups. So for instance, on, on the game for uh, new mothers, um, if you don't have your baby's weight checked every six months, then the snake swallows you. And if you do, then you can get a ladder up. So we develop all these games, and we find that on many issues where it's embarrassing for people to talk about things like HIV or like sexual reproductive health issues, when you bring games out, especially in slum areas or in colleges where sex education is still not talked about, everyone goes, <gasps> if you talk about it, that things like this or role playing has a tremendous effect in opening up people. And that once they have participated in something like this, then everything comes pouring out. Then they're not shy anymore. A few years ago, when both my children were teenagers, and they went to school where others like our children would come, uh, children of professionals, children of doctors, lawyers, whom one would think make the real world known to their children. Uh, and they would come to play with my kids or be with my kids, and I would engage them in conversation. I was absolutely horrified to understand that neither their parents nor the kind of schools they went to were making them at all aware of what the realities of India was. That they had bought this India shining story as much as probably all of you who aren't engaged with India have. And that they really thought that the greatest choice in their lives was to choose between Nike and Adidas. And they felt that everything that was wrong with India had been gotten rid of in 1947 when we got independence. And I thought, you know, we take great pride. We say China is an aging population, but India is this young population, and it's our young people who are going to lead the world, and so on. But if the young people didn't know any better than to know what India was, how were these people going to become leaders? So I created a piece called Unheard Voices. It was based on a book of the same name by a colleague of mine who used to be in the Indian Administrative Service. And it was the stories of 20 people he had met over 20 years 
who all came in one way or another from marginalized communities. Some marginalized by birth because of the caste system, some because of an illness they had, some because of the religion in which they were, some because of their circumstances. But all of them had one thing in common, that they fought for justice. Some won, some didn't win. And I thought, these are extraordinary stories. I must bring them to life. So we created a piece that could specifically go into elite colleges and high schools to engage children into a discussion about what real India was and how important that they become the change and that they had to be the engine to bring this, how, how fortunate they were in their birth, in their education, and did they even look out of this little thing they had created? So we went to 100 colleges and schools pro bono. And the way the show was created was by using Bollywood songs to engage the kids. And it was a huge hit. And by the end of it, we had more than 7,000 volunteers who had taken an oath to actually be the change every single day. It was after we created the piece that we started meeting the people who were the real people that I had created from their histories. And I just want to show you a short excerpt of Unheard Voices so that you see the kind of work and see the reaction of young people and of their teachers in the schools in which we went. Sorry, can we have the light off again? India 2007, the Sensex zooming skywards. New millionaires and a surging middle class. Multiplexes and newer shopping malls. New airlines and never an available seat. Showy parties highlighted on page threes and poured over by millions of wannabes. Gucci shoes at a lakh and a half and a burgeoning luxury goods market. India 2007. 360 million people living on less than 45 rupees a day. 46% of children under five malnourished. 80% of women suffering anemia. 49% of all children married when they are still children. 800,000 people, 95% of them women and girls, carrying excreta, human excreta, as a profession. India 2007, a country in need of a conscience, a country in need of change, of new directions, of newer solutions to real problems, a country in need of listening to the unheard voices of her people. Mission I want to do something for the children. But my senior told me that I will work for the school for the children. But I want to work for the children for the children. So, I started to meet them, talk to them, play with them. I started to play with them. Almost always there is that distrust in the beginning. Because the image is so very strong. Almost always there is that distrust in the beginning. Because the image of society is there. Why people at all should be interested. And especially now with the consumerism, most people feel that if someone wants to look good, there must be some ulterior motive. Now, I want to open a shop for the bijli here in Bangalore. I also want to see the place of the bijli. Now, I will teach the girls to live on the foot part. And I will also give them a job. So that they can live a better life. My way. Sat 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 Sat
क्या सच है कि तुम अपने परिवार के साथ चंदेरी में रहते थे तुमने कहा कि तुम तालाब में लाशों के बीच छिपी थी इसका कोई गवाह है तुमने अपने गांव के मुखिया को दोषी ठहराया है तुम्हें कैसे पता कि वह वहाँ था तुमने कहा कि तुम सब अपने दादा के घर में छिपे थे क्या यह सही है तुम्हारे अनुसार कितने लोग मारे गए इसका और कोई गवाह नहीं है सिवाय तुम्हारे तुम बढ़ा चढ़ा कर झूठ बोलती हो हमें बहुत सारा धमकियां भी मिला कि आप तुम गवा दोगे तो तुम्हें जान से मार देंगे या कुछ भी कहीं से उठा लेंगे ये बहुत सारा मिला जबकि छोटे छोटे बच्चों को पकड़ के चिरा था तो उस वक्त का मुझे याद आता तो मुझे किसी से डर नहीं लगता बहुत धमकियां बहुत लालच इतने लालच मिले कि अभी मैं करोड़ों रुपये में खेल सकती थी मगर मैंने उस पैसे पर मतलब थूका तक नहीं What are we doing? We are just negating their existence by not looking at them. So the first thing to do is to acknowledge their presence. Second thing is, instead of thinking big and thinking, oh, what can we do, and you know, make impossible plans and big projects, think small. Do small things. I, as a teacher, what I think I can do is make my students think critically. And expose them to these kind of issues so that they can make a difference. I think uh, our children are not exposed to these things. They are not even going to believe that all these things actually happen. So, क्या हम इस शर्म को realize करने के लिए तैयार हैं? और शर्म को realize करते हुए सवालों को address करते हुए हम किस हद तक आगे जाना चाहते हैं? National level पर या कोई भी level पर कोई भी ऐसा काम होता है, तो मैं जरूर करना चाहूँगी जो एक element of hope. आपने जो उसमें डाला उससे मुझे लगता है कि ये जो हमारे बच्चे हैं उनमें कहीं ना कहीं देश की जुडिशरी में और उससे भी ज्यादा अपने आप में कहीं यकीन आएगा कि यस देर इज अ होप एंड वी कैन बी द इंस्ट्रूमेंट ऑफ चेंज कैन वी हैव द लाइट्स ऑन प्लीज सो दैट्स अ लिटिल बिट ऑफ द काइंड ऑफ वर्क वी डू we're running out of time. I was going to show you something else, but we shall now go into conversation with Adil. Where is Adil? <laughs> Actually, we are going to go into conversation with you. First of all, applause uh, <coughs> for a wonderful, wonderful, and stimulating uh, Actually, if I could also ask uh, uh, Andre, Andre Deportes to please join us. And also joining us is the uh, Dean of the College of Fine Arts, uh, Benjamin. Wallace, uh, if you could also join us. And what we wanted to do here is, uh, I'm not going to give uh, long introductions here, please. Andrew, you want to come? What, we, what I wanted to do was to maybe start with, uh, with, with Dean Sorry. Juarez and, uh, and, and Andre to, to um, launch a conversation. Your world is very different from mine. I, I would describe myself as also maybe working on the periphery of social change. But when people in my world want to bring about social change, we write a report. Uh, we, we draw up a graph. We, we make a table. We, we, we get some data. Uh, and, 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 and this has been an absolutely sort of enlightening uh, discourse on, on, on how social change really happens. And, and maybe we can have a conversation here. But first, first hear from you, if I might, and then I'll, I'll ask uh, both, both Dean Juarez and Andre to, to, to jump in. Uh, what about those who are opposing the change? I started off by showing you an excerpt from a piece of mine called Sita's Daughters. Now, this is a piece that I created, and I started off with a title which is perplexing to anybody who is a reader of our great epic, the Ramayana, because Sita didn't have daughters. Except that I started with mythology. Uh, I discovered that it's no use trying to say mythology is wrong. It's better to actually take mythology and to try and find ways around it. So for instance, in India, Many goddesses are made into goddesses, but all for the wrong reasons. Uh, they're made into goddesses because they follow the male line. And Sita is one such amazing woman who has been reduced to this really puny, boring woman who jumps into the fire because her husband thinks that she slept with somebody else. So I took Sita and I retold the Ramayana through her eyes and then went on to talk about issues like the second one, you, the one you saw about female feticides and a doctor 
who used to be doing this, not realizing that she's helping killing off lots of girl children, and a woman who has been multiply raped by her upper caste principal and so on. And I have done over 550 performances of this show. I first thought it was relevant only to India. Then for the first time when I took it out, I had women of all nationalities coming and saying, you know, it doesn't matter if the stories are Indian, but these are stories that happen in all our cultures. And I remember some of the early shows where men would stomp out, uh, saying, this is ridiculous. How can you insult Rama and so on? But I also know, for instance, when I was performing this in Britain, and on the surface of it, it is very anti-Hindu to the revivalist Hindu, Hindutva people. But I remember that the head priest of all the temples in Britain coming and holding my hand and saying, my daughter, you have reinterpreted the stories and the Vedas would be proud of you. So one has both. I've had, outside the show, I have had the right-wing Hindutva forces trying to burn down the theater. So it goes both so, ways. If, if, I could, if I could ask Dean, Dean Juarez, who's, who's new, still new to Boston University, so we can still say welcome uh, <laughs> to BU, even though we are on your home turf. Uh, Dean Juarez is a conductor, a scholar. He has conducted orchestras in his native Mexico, in China, in Paris, and all over in between. And I won't go through the long, long uh, and, and wonderful CV that I have here. But, but, but looking at this from a Latin American perspective, maybe, what is it that she is doing in the story she is telling that you find that is different or similar in the role of the arts in bringing about social change? Well, I think we are very close to India in many ways. And we were just sharing that Malika's mother worked with Amal Hernandez, a dear friend and mentor and founder of the Ballet Folklorico in Mexico. But my, my main interest, Malika, after welcoming you and welcoming all to, to the College of Fine Arts, is that we work a lot throughout the world at conservatories, theater, music, visual arts, film schools, to train people in their discipline. But we have to educate them also to be yes. critical and to play a role in, in the society, just as Beethoven was very much committed to to what was happening in his world and, and to the wars and to the uh, social changes that were being happening uh, in, in his time. And every artist that, has, that wants to be relevant in posterity has to be relevant in their, in own, their own time and has to deal with the Ramayanas, with our history that may be called the canon, that may be called many different ways. And also, if you can share with us the importance of management, because I see three arenas, our artistic arena, the social arena where we want to make a contribution and change, but also the place where we meet with our service and with our work, the marketplace. And we have to interact in those three worlds in order to be sustainable and successful and relevant. When um, I told you that I started on this path after I had spent five years with the Mahabharata, when I went away for the Mahabharata, I was considered the new star on the dance horizon. When I came back, I decided to do this work. And most of my colleagues said, Malika, you are committing harakiri. If you try and educate people, nobody is going to come to see you. You won't have an audience. And I deferred. And the fact remains that Today, I have probably more audiences wanting to see my different work than my classical work, but I continue with my classical work. I think that it's a bit like giving a placebo in the medical field. <laughs> you know, as long as it's entertaining, uh, it has to be riveting. Mm -hmm. If it becomes boring, you've lost your audience. And I think that is why I consider Darpana as a research and development laboratory for the arts, where we are constantly pushing the frontier of what can make it more theatrical, what can make it more interesting, how can we bring in music that has everybody tapping and singing to it, how do we bring in multimedia, how do we bring in all sorts of things to make it more engaging to any kind of audience. 
But I think that is one of the keys. And mm -hmm. uh, that's why I said that if I think there is a uniqueness about us, is that we come from the arts world. Therefore, we come trained to be able to see what an audience wants, what different audiences want, and then be able to bring this work in. Mm -hmm. I find that a lot of NGOs in India and Latin mm -hmm. America and Africa come with wonderfully good wishes to use the arts, but they are not trained and they end up using the arts very badly, which reflects badly on the arts and badly mm -hmm. on their work. And I think perhaps that is the management interface. People will come to see Malika Sarabhai perform. If I've been able to create that, then I can perform most anything. They might walk out, but that is also a political statement. <laughs> you know, it's better than saying, yes, we've seen it all, we don't want to discuss it. So I think I think that that that's really where I where where I try to plug it. Mm -hmm. And it's easier said than done, of course. Yes, of course it is, and of course <laughs> you fall flat at times, but but it works. Before I open up, and I'm sure the audience has a lot of questions, I wanted to ask Andre. Andre is a music uh, professor of music here, uh, originally from India. As as you see this, as you think of your students here in the U.S. before that in Australia, and I'll, I'll maybe also ask Malika the same question. How do you see? arts that is so rooted in a culture, in a place, in a mythology, in a story, in a tradition, in a memory, translating beyond that memory, beyond that tradition, beyond that story in our globalizing world? I mean, part of the answer is given in just the faces of the people in the room. Uh, but, but I thought you might want to sort of say something about that. I think largely both artists and non-artists underestimate the power of the arts. Um, underestimate the power of the arts in all kinds of ways. Uh, underestimate the power of the arts as uh, tools for personal transformation, for social change, uh, for messaging, as metaphor, as description, as political commentary. We, 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 are, we underestimate it. And, and for, for what's happening, uh, what's happened, I think, uh, is that many artists who achieve the highest technical capacity, almost like Olympic athletes, have become in some ways disconnected from understanding how powerful they can be as artists to make the world a better place. And, and if the world, if, if, I don't know if, if it's possible to say that the world is in a worse situation now than it's ever been, but I think we know that the scope of our, of our problems are enormous. And artists simply have to, you're talking about the story, have to participate in the construction of a better world. And they have to use their discipline, just in the same way that we expect historians or, or political scientists or, or, uh, or medical people to use their discipline to make the, make the world a better place. We have to expect the artists to do so. And coincidentally, last night I was reading the book Gaviotas, as some of you may have read it, called A Village to Reinvent the World. And I'll give you this as an example. Uh, I'm, uh, the, I recommend the book to you. Because uh, high up in the, in the Bolivian mountains, uh, a group from a, from a bank went there with a project, a development project, and they had some unspent money at the end of the project. So they, so they said uh, to, the, to the village elders, uh, uh, we, we, we have some unspent money from our, from our budget. We'd like to give you a gift. Tell us what you want to have. So the village elders went away and they, then they, and they discussed and for five minutes and they came back and they said, we would like musical instruments. And, uh, and this is documented. You have to read the book. It's very interesting. And the, the, so the representative of the bank said, I don't think you understand. He said, they said, we think you need electricity, we think you need, <laughs> we need, you, we need, you need uh, telephones, you need infrastructure, you need uh, water. This sounds like, like someone soap. like me. Email. All those kinds of <laughs> <laughs> All those kinds of things. And, 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 the, and very quick, case, uh, the village elder said, we don't think you understand. He said, everyone in our village plays a musical instrument. Uh, and every uh, Sunday after, after going to mass, we have a, we have a, retreta, a retreta, which is a kind of retreat, and everybody gets together and plays music. And after we play music, we, we get together and talk about our problems. And the music brings us together. And our musical instruments are falling apart. And without music, uh, without, musical in, without musical instruments, we can't make music. And without music, our community will fall apart. 
Lovely and, story. And that is a tremendous story about, about the way in which, in which music conceives and conceptualizes, mobilizes a community, and provides a vehicle not only for the messaging, but for being a crucible through which personal and community transformation can take place. Uh, is that that's a very long so, answer? It's a wonderful answer. Long it's, it's, answer it's a wonderful your. answer. Maybe I'll ask Malika and then, then open up. Is the music falling apart? If you look at the world as a whole, or or even India, is it falling is apart? Certainly falling apart. Or is it coming <laughs> together? No, no, the world is falling apart. We think we are coming together, but that coming together is also a falling apart because we are not coming together as human beings. We are coming together as two robots on two machines. Mm -hmm. And I think certainly the power of music, the power of the arts, and what what you were saying uh, that. It's very easy in any field to become technically superb. But if you do not know what to do with that technique, how you can actually let spirits soar, then that technique is nothing. And this is true of whether you become a doctor or you become a, an IT wizard or you become a technically superb violinist. Technique can only be a passage to making the mind so, to making the world a better place, to healing people, to making life better. But, but Otherwise, what is the point of technique? What am I going to do with this technique? But, Hang but, myself. But for all three of you, is, are the arts doing what you all say no. they should be doing? No, 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 no. This is my great tragedy. I will talk of India only. That after 30 years, I have not been able... I have, I have trained lots of people in NGOs to become better actors or to become better dancers or to be better creators. I have not been able to inspire one single arts institution to take change as a commitment because that's not where the money is. On that happy note, <laughs> <laughs> let me open up. So please, if you can speak into the microphone just so that it's recorded and say who you are. Can you also introduce yourself for those who may not? John Satchel, director of Center for Einstein Studies at Boston University. There was a great black leader in 19th century America named Frederick Douglass. And he summarized his experience by saying, without struggle, there is no progress. And he also pointed out that just because you present a problem and show people there is a solution, and you then wait for the powers that be to act, you will live and die before they act. It has to be organization. So first must come giving people a sense of the existence of a problem. Then another important thing, as Babel Davis had pointed out in his book on the liberation of Guinea, you didn't have to convince the peasants of Guinea they were oppressed, they knew that. You had to give them hope for some solution, because no matter how terrible the situation is, they're not going to risk it, uh, their lives or worse unless you give them some hope for a possibility. So you first have to give them uh, an exposition of the problem, so them a way forward, and then organize. And I think, for example, someone like Joan Baez example of the, putting your body on the line, not just your songs, but your body. And I think it's very important that we follow through with, with exposition, uh, with action. Yeah. Maybe we can take one or two other comments and, and questions. Somebody here in the front. Some, uh, Suchi? Uh, Suchi Gopal, professor at CAS. Monica, I had a question. The picture that you sort of walk away with, you know, seeing your face <coughs> and women, is sort of depressing and very bleak, given the fact that we are in 21st century. Do you see any hope? You talk about the role of arts and so on, but do you, as a feminist, see any improvement, uh, you know, with all these social changes? What is your prognosis and diagnosis? Oh, I am not dejected at all. I am dejected at what the policy makers and the politicians are doing and the greed of the corporates. I have absolute hope in the people. And one of the reasons we are working so much at the grassroots is for every woman or every man who changes, you are changing a family. And I am filled with hope for people because I have seen so much change. The point is, how do we get that change to a critical mass to actually change the country? And a lot of my work now is in trying to link people who are doing extraordinary work across India to say, how do we come together as a voice? Because it's very easy to make a voice out of hatred. But it's somehow much more difficult to make a voice out of the positiveness. Because by definition, that positiveness will want a democratic and inclusive process, which is 60 times longer than, than saying, you will kill. But in India, I see immense hope. The very fact that I'm still in business, the very fact that I'm still being called, is hope. 
Because otherwise, like my colleague said 30 years ago, I would have been wiped off as an artist. And more and more young people are just, I mean, I gave a TED talk and I get a hundred emails from unknown people every week saying, we are training as artists. What you do really turns us on. Tell us what we can do to take that forward. Wherever I go to colleges like this and I'm talking to young artists-to-be, they're totally engaged in the kind of work I'm talking about, in what they can do to actually make that change. So no, I'm very, very optimistic. Mm. Dean Harris, can I push on, on what Malika just said and what she said earlier about there isn't the money here? I, is that an Indian dilemma? Is that an Asian dilemma? Or is that a global dilemma that, that the money is, then the greed is, is pushing us elsewhere, even though there is this fervor in people of wanting to do this? Uh, or is there an infrastructure there that, that these people who are writing her the emails, now I've seen the TED performance, it is wonderful, uh, where they can catch on some, is there a fire in the world? I think that, yes, many, many of us see a growing, perhaps majority of people as consumers, not as citizens, not as responsible citizens. But in these globalized times, we belong to several tribes at the same time. So nobody is a pure citizen and nobody is a pure consumer. Nobody is a pure artist anyway. We are very complex individuals. And I think what um, universities that have programs in the arts, conservatories and art schools are trying to do now worldwide is not only to train a, uh, a student in, in, in their discipline, but really to create leaders. And another example of similar work is what has been going uh, at El Sistema in Venezuela. I mean, just five, ten years ago, who would have thought that the conductor of the Los Angeles Philharmonic could be a young Venezuelan conduct artist who is not even 30 years old? Or that the Berlin Philharmonic or leading orchestras of the world could be hiring young Venezuelan musicians? And this started not as a music program is not part of the cultural system. It's a social project that has music as a tool. But it's very important. Quality and rigor are not negotiable Absolutely. either. We Absolutely. have to have, if, if we have the fullest commitment to our discipline and to excellence, that doesn't mean that we have to put away our social commitment. And if we have social commitment, that doesn't mean that it'd be okay to be a mediocre artist. Exactly. It's twice as difficult, but that's the way that the 21st century expects the relevant artist to be. And that's tough. Tough it is. Right there at the back, yes, we have the mic. Yeah, hi. Uh, first I wanna s yeah, it's just for okay. recording. Uh, I want to say thank you so much for your work. It's very profoundly moving. Each piece, I, I was very touched, and I'm really pleased to have you here today. Um, you will be speaking in my class tomorrow, actually, for three hours, possibly. So <laughs> we have more time to continue. I wanted to invite others who may be feeling that you were hoping your students were here today. If they would like to come to my seminar tomorrow, they're welcome to join us in 808, the second floor, room 281, from 2 to 5. Uh, please uh, invite your students um, to join us. But I, I wanted to ask, um, on the level of organization, you have the, the work, you have the artistry and the meaning, and it's all there in a powerful package. What did you do with those 7,000 volunteers, you know, for example, who came forward? Where do you go with that? Uh, in mo we, we have a website where they can share what they are doing. My advice to them or my suggestion to them was not to start big, not to say I will change the world, but to say look around you. Do you, for instance, have somebody who comes to clean your house? Have you checked if they have kids? If they have kids, they probably go to lousy schools. Can you take two hours a week to coach them in science, math, and English? Because those kids probably don't have the money to go to a tuition class. And if you give them that little fillip of these three subjects, they will do well and it'll open up things for them. Or does your maid know anything about basics of hygiene, like what it would do to her family's health if the water she drank was filtered? 
and how to filter it. I said, you learn this in your science class, in your biology class. Can you tell your servants? You come to school every day, you see the same beggars at the same crossroads, and you pretend that your world ends here. Have you ever tried to wave to them? Have you then, they'll probably not wave, they'll probably make a fist at you. But after 15 days, maybe they will wave. And then have you asked them how they are? Don't give them money. Have you asked them their name and do you say hi every day? Just give them that because it will make them feel that they are alive, that they are alive for you, and that self-worth will go a long way. And this is how they started. Some of the schools and colleges became volunteers themselves. For instance, there is a Mount Carmel convent in my city, and the parents and teachers had a meeting, and they have become a volunteer school who runs a parallel school for women and girl beggars outside on the footpath where they teach them basics of life skills. Things like, how do you ward off men? How do you look after yourself when you have a period? What should you do health-wise? And through that, and through playing games with them, are slowly teaching them how to read and write, asking them about the dreams they have. Would they like an alternate lifestyle? Suppose they could bring in the 20 rupees that their parents needed, if somebody were to give them that 20 rupees to come and study, would they come and study? And things like this. So it can go from something as small as that to things much larger. But we really encourage them to engage in a very personal way. Because we found that once you saw even that much of a change, it is an addiction that you can't give up. You know, actually helping people is one of the greatest addictions. And we are banking on that. Do you see, Malika, this attitude of arts for social change seeping into the popular uh, arts too? You know Especially the, in a country like India with such a huge... For the first time, Adil, uh, over the last year, we have seen Bollywood producing films which are socially relevant and still highly entertaining. There's a recent film, there are two recent films. One is a mega, mega hit. It's Th called Three The Three Idiots. Three Idiots, yeah. And my my it's kids a, love it. It's an amazing <laughs> commentary from some of our biggest stars on the absurdity of our education system. The other one is called Pipli Live, and it's a, it's a commentary on the 24-7 news channels that it is heart-wrenching, but hysterically funny. And recently, just to show you how it's affecting people, recently the Prime Minister ordered the entire parliament to watch it, <laughs> to understand the ridiculousness of government schemes and what becomes of those schemes by the time they reach the people. And I think, so it is seeping. It's small, it's slow, but if films, which are the, the, the most widely watched things, if films and television, that's why we do a lot of work in television, we are trying to gather the money together for a film, but if you can use the most popular genres, then you've really got a movement working. Andre, do you see the same movement elsewhere in the world? I mean, I'm thinking of music and I'm thinking of Shakira and the Football World Cup. An African colleague of mine said that song, Waka Waka, did as much for African pride at that moment as all the rest of the Football World Cup put together. I mean, partly it was Shakira, partly it was the music, partly it was the moment, but everything came together in a sense that, you know, we can do. You know, for the last two years, I've become more and more passionate about looking for things. So I don't know whether it's getting more or, or whether it's my... You are just finding well, more things. <laughs> I'm just finding more things because it's extraordinary. I mean, I didn't, until two years ago, I didn't know um, what was happening in prisons. And now uh, in, I've been discovering so much of the work that's happening in prisons all over the world, uh, music in prisons. Um, for example, and uh, um, I just have uh, been looking at quite a lot of uh, work in music and conflict transformation, and so there is a lot of there's a, obviously a considerable amount of work there. Until I, you know, until I got involved in the whole area of uh, the arts and music and public health as community enterprise, I wasn't aware of the extent to which it's a rich uh, source of uh, activity and a, and, a, and a rich field. So. I don't know whether it's getting more or whether I'm just getting better informed. Mm -hmm. uh, but, but I th will say one thing, that, that while the dominant paradigm is what we see around us all the time, there is a move uh, around us 
to for want people to want to shift this dominant paradigm, to shift us away, to connect the arts. So many artists, I think, are, are wanting to do this, to, to make the arts a better place. I think that's kind of happening. I, I, I'm encouraged. I, I share your optimism. While I feel, you know, feel, I think there's, there's no time to be lost, I, but I think, I think we do have to acknowledge the efforts of people. One of the things I, I read recently is Peter Singer's book, The Life You Can Save. You know, he's an, he's an ethicist. Um, and I think with the same question in that book should be asked of every single artist. How can you save a life through the arts? Because it's your obligation. It's your responsibility. Others? We have a question here. If we can have the mic again just so that it's recorded. By the way, the recording will be uh, put up on all sorts of websites around BU, so, so, so we'll be there for posterity. Uh, my name is Tess Helgren. Is it yes. on? OK, great. Um, and I'm actually a senior at Harvard College. But thank you so much for coming today. It was really, really an inspiration to see what you're doing as a dancer and as an activist and combining those. Um, and my question was actually about how the relationship between your classical work and the work that we saw today and how you're, are you using them for the same sort of purposes and what the relationship is. And if you feel that there are different audiences you can reach through these different forms that, that your company does. Like the dean mentioned, I think the classical work continues to hone my skill and is also my battery recharger. Because the sheer energy and joy that it unleashes in me powers all the other work. I insist that everybody in the group hones their classical skills because I think it gives a grounding that can then make everything else seem possible. It's like, unless you have learned a language extremely well, and unless you can spell correctly and grammatically put a sentence together, you don't really have the right to vitiate it. Because then when you're vitiating, you're vitiating with the knowledge of what it is. So that's one answer. That's why I say that I treat Darpana as an R&D center from which all this can happen. Uh, the second thing is that, for instance, in Bharatanatyam, because of 2,000 years of primarily male writers, there was a serious patriarchy that had crept in. And I have done a lot of research in finding the non-patriarchal uh, mm -hmm. verses, mm -hmm. uh, the voices which are, which are no less devotional. Mm -hmm but they are not subjugatedly devotional. So even in my classical work, I try and find these strands. And in India, there are plenty of strands if you just look, because there were always feisty women, and there were always feisty women writers. So in some senses, they feed off each other. All three of you are hopeful, and I, 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 I am hopeful because you are hopeful. But the fact also remains that there is the arts world whose message is very different from yours. I mean, we sing, still sing praises of war and praises of our narrow identities. Uh, I mean, there's, there's a lot of, lo lot of the use of the arts, it seems to me, still, or maybe I'm to wrong. To be jingoistic. To, to be jingoistic, to be, na to be narrowly nationalistic, to, 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 to fine tune our identity until it's just me and you who's in that identity. Uh, how, how, what is, what is, the, what is the, the, battle is the wrong word, but, but what, what, how, how does that world of arts interact with the world that you are hopeful about? How do the people who scream terror all the time interact with the people who say that goodness still exists? I think it's the same. I think, I think for many, many years, all our political forces have tried to make us feel more and more afraid that the next person is going to snatch something away from you. Somebody's going to take the cherry off your cake. Somebody's going to take your money away. Somebody's going to take your woman away. Somebody's, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. And we are so filled as, as a human race of fear and negativity. But we mustn't forget that there is a, there is a positivity. There is a light in us. And I think what we are trying to do is, is to say, you can get in touch with that light. And if it didn't happen, all three of us would be without a job. <laughs> <laughs> we do not want that to happen. We, we have a question here, gentlemen. Uh, yeah. Yes. Hi. I was wondering, how does a musician trained in the Western canon, how does this all relate in a practical sense? Well, that's a very good question. And that has to do with um, the answer that we expect our students and, and the next generations to do through their lives. I mean, we can see, for example, in, in uh, movements similar to, 
to El Sistema in Venezuela, how a training in classical music can be about bringing people together, about changing lives, about giving hope, about uh, being proud of, uh, of your own work, whether or not you are a professional musician, and to know that you are empowered and that you can succeed in life, whether or not you are a professional musician, but that you will have always that by your side, and that just like the, the local foods and the local histories, Beethoven is part of your, of your heritage and part of yourself. And Mozart is as much part of you as mangoes and avocados. And that's a tremendous richness and very, very powerful. Uh, you know, I Gloria, if you're comfortable rewriting this final bit of Beethoven's Ninth so that, so that it somehow practically fits in with health or you know, from a more practical, how does the canon itself fit into any of this? Or maybe it doesn't. It's how does how do the classic works uh, in I the Western let me sense? Give you, let me give you an example. I mean, I, uh, because because I think I think classical works, like every work, can be contextualized to, to other things. Uh, I gave up I gave a performance of Messiah in in Indonesia, and as you may know, there is a, there is a huge problem between Christians and Muslims in Indonesia. So I, I thought, you know, I, uh, the interesting thing about Messiah is that Messiah is actually an Old Testament text, and because it's the Old Testament text of the. Prophecy of Isaiah is actually a prophecy of Isaiah that belongs to the Quran as well. And so, well, a couple of things we can do. One is we can, we can interpolate Quranic recitation within, uh, within the, the, the Messiah to take, to take fine passages in the Quran that, that are uh, similar to the recitatives in the prophecy of Isaiah and, and actually to deliver them as in recitative, so so it already builds a connection between the between the Muslim community and the Christian community. Uh, you know, the first two words of Messiah, the recitative, are comfort, comfort ye. ye, comfort ye. So, and and if you deliver those words, those two words in in Arabic or in, I mean, they, they are powerful words. It's a profound message of peace and reconciliation. I think what we do, I mean, you can perform Messiah in, in a box, mm -hmm. like the Western canon, but if you want to contextualize it without, without destroying it, I mean, Bach and Handel and Beethoven were cool, imaginative people who were contextualizing their art. Why shouldn't we? And, and I don't think it's about saying, well, we need to do contemporary stuff to do it. No, I think Bach can be. So Sleeper's Wake, for example, or uh, you know, the, the Bach cantata, all sorts of messages. And we can, we can uncode, decode the, the stuff that's in the Western canon. And the other thing to do is to, to identify what about the Western canon represents the power structures. For example, the Western canon represents the power of the church and the court. And we need to know that it's that, that's the, 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 the music, that's the culture we're speaking with, you know? And why should we, Western <coughs> canon, marginalize the, the people who are dispossessed? Who knows about the, the music of the Western, of, of Europe, outside of the court and the church? We need to get to know that. So people who are, in the, who are educated in the Western canon need to get to know what that, that is. Malika and I were talking about it in India, too. Mm -hmm. Everyone knows Bharat Natam, knows about the sitar, knows about that stuff. Who knows about the music of the tribal people? Millions, 60 million tribal people. Who knows the music of them? You know, People say to me, you're Indian? Oh, uh, t t uh, I, uh, I, I love Ravi Shankar. I think to myself, what the hell are you telling me, Ravi Shankar? <laughs> well, I, I just have to tell you that now the ethnomusicology class of this university knows about tribal music. <laughs> right. You know, but this is the, we have to kind of really take away, build the bridges, you know, take the canon and really re-examine the canon, re-sculpt it, reposition it. As, as, we run out of, as we run out of time, and, and, and there's, there's plenty of time to continue this conversation, uh, Malika is an, is an amazingly busy schedule. Andre is going to keep her busy, including the class tomorrow. Let me ask one question maybe of all three, and I'll start with the dean and end and, and with Malika on this note of building bridges. For those of us who, who are not in the world of arts, uh, but are looking towards you to do what we haven't been able to. What is it that those outside of this world can do mm -hmm. to make your job easier in, in, in making this music work and in, 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 in bringing that hope 
in, in realizing these bridges. What is that, what is it that those outside of this world, those in the world of development, for example, what would you say to the UN Secretary General? Uh, what would you say to the President of BU? Uh, that they can do, that can unleash the power that you are all so passionately talking about? Well, first of all, I would say that there's no one outside of True. the world of music or the world of True. art or the world of theater because <coughs> uh, I remember a New Yorker cartoon where there were two cavemen, one talking to the other, one was a painter, saying, I hope that one day we have a cave devoted just to art. <laughs> the thing is that the cave was devoted to many things, but we now visit the caves and we look and we see <laughs> art. And every society has its caves. And we have just to be aware that we are, are all part of, uh, of this and that art is, art's mission is to bring people together. And um, it's just as long as we see ourselves and identify us in these different wonderful mirrors that are the arts that we can learn more about ourselves and what we can do to change the society we're living in. Know thyself, all artists. <laughs> I'm gonna, I would ask you, Adil, the question, because I think it's, it's the question of like in the Gaviotas. It's the people in the World Bank, you know, or whichever bank there was in the book, they don't actually understand, uh, fully appreciate what the arts oh. can do. So I think we need to work as teams, you know, people from who work, you know, Economics, across these policy. disciplines, kind of helping to understand so, so that we can build communities of understanding, uh, uh, not just mm -hmm. that we, we want you to know about the arts transformation, but we need to know about what you do. We don't know about what you do and how you can inform the work that we do. So Conversation. Mm -hmm. Alika, last word. I think if we do not recognize the power of the arts as a language for change, we are missing one of the greatest languages. And till the day that art is still seen as entertainment, song and dance, we are going to be missing this. The arts coupled with the rest of the world can actually be the greatest transformative force. Until we think that the arts are a cherry on the cake of life, mm -hmm. rather than the yeast in the cake of life, we will be missing something very important. Wonderful, wonderful, wonderful note to, to, to end on.